Chapter 11. Diggory and his uncle are both in trouble. You may think the animals were very stupid not to see at once that Uncle Andrew was the same kind of creature as the two children in the cabbie. But you must remember that the animals knew nothing about clothes. They thought that Polly's frock and Diggory's Norfolk suit and the cabbie's bowler hat were as much parts of them as their own fur and feathers. They wouldn't have known even that the, those three were all of the same kind if they hadn't spoken to them and if Strawberry had not seemed to think so. And Uncle Andrew was a great deal taller than the children and a good deal thinner than the cabbie. He was all in black except for his white waistcoat, not very white by now, and the great grey mop of his hair, now very wild indeed, didn't look to them like anything they had seen in the three other humans. So it was only natural that they should be puzzled. Worst of all, he didn't seem to be able to talk. He had tried to, when the bulldog spoke to him, or as he thought, first snarled and then growled at him. He held out his shaking hand and gasped, Good doggy then, poor old fellow. But the beasts could not understand him any more than he could understand them. They didn't hear words, only a vague sizzling noise. Perhaps it was just as well they didn't, for no dog that I never knew, least of all a talking dog of Narnia, likes being called a good doggy then. And many more than you would like being called my little man. Then Uncle Andrew dropped down in a dead faint. There, said a warthog, it's only a tree, I always thought so. Remember, they had never yet seen a faint or even a fall. The bulldog, who had been sniffing Uncle Andrew all over, raised its head and said, it's an animal, certainly an animal, and probably the same kind as the, those other ones. I don't see that, said one of the bears. An animal wouldn't just roll over like that. We're animals and we don't roll over. We stand up like this. He rose to his hind legs, took a step backwards, tripped over a low branch and fell flat on his back. The third joke, the third joke, the third joke, said the jackdaw in great excitement. I still think it's a sort of tree, said the warthog. If it's a tree, said the other bear, there might be a bee's nest in it. I'm sure it's not a tree, said the badger. I had a sort of idea it was trying to speak before it toppled over. That was only the wind in its branches, said the warthog. You surely don't mean, said the jackdaw to the badger, that you think it's a talking animal. It didn't say any other words. And yet, you know, said the elephant, the she-elephant, of course, her husband, as you remember, had been called away by Aslan. And yet, you know, it might be an animal of some kind. Mightn't the whitish lump at the end be a sort of face? And couldn't those holes be eyes and a mouth? No nose, of course. But then, ahem, <clears throat> one mustn't be narrow-minded. Very few of us have what you could exactly call a nose. She squinted down the length of her own trunk with pardonable pride. I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. The elephant is quite right, said the tapir. I tell you what, said the donkey brightly, perhaps it's an animal that can talk but thinks it can. Can it be made to stand up, said the elephant thoughtfully. She took the limp from Uncle Andrew gently in her trunk and set him up on one end. Upside down, unfortunately, so that two half sovereigns, three half crowns and a sixpence fell out of his pocket. But it was no use, Uncle Andrew merely collapsed again. There said several voices. It isn't an animal at all. It's not alive. I tell you, it is an animal, said the bulldog. Smell it for yourself. Smelling isn't everything, said the elephant. Why, said the bulldog, if a fellow can't trust his nose, then what can he trust? Well, his brains, perhaps, she said mildly. I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. Well, we must do something about it, said the elephant, because it may be the evil, and it must be shown to Aslan. What do you most think, what do most of us think? Is it an animal or something or some kind of tree? Tree, tree, said a dozen voices. Very well, said the elephant, then if it's a tree, it wants to be planted. We must dig a hole. The two moles settled that part of the business, but pretty quickly. 
There was some dispute as to which way up Uncle Andrew ought to be put into the hole, and he had a very narrow escape from being put in head foremost. Several animals said his legs must be his branches, and therefore the grey fluffy thing, they meant his head, must be his roots. But then others said that he, the forked end of him was the muddier and that it spread out more, as roots ought to do so. So finally he was planted the right way up. When they had patted down the earth and it came up above his knees, it looks dreadfully withered, said the donkey. Of course, it wants some watering, said the elephant. I think I might say, meaning no offence to anyone present, but perhaps for that sort of work, my kind of nose, I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. But the elephant walked quietly to the river, filled her trunk with water and came back to attend to Uncle Andrew. The sagacious animal went on down doing this till gallons of water had been squirted over him and the water was running out of the skirts of his frock coat as if he had been for a bath with all his clothes on. In the end it revived him. He awoke from his faint. What awakening it was! But we must leave him to think over his wicked deed if he was likely to do anything so sensible and turn to more important things. Strawberry trotted on with Diggory on his back till the noise of the other animals died away and now the little group of Aslan and his chosen counsellors was quite close. Diggory knew that he couldn't possibly break in on a solemn meeting but there was no need to do so. At a word from Aslan the he elephant, the ravens and all the rest of them drew aside. Diggory slipped off the horse and found himself face to face with Aslan. And Aslan was bigger and more beautiful and more brightly golden and more terrible than he had thought. He dared not look into his great eyes. Please, Mr Lion, Aslan, sir, said Diggory, could you, may I, please will you give me some magic fruit of this country to make my mother well? He had been desperately hoping that the lion would say yes. He had been horribly afraid it might say no, but he was taken aback when it did neither. This is the boy, said Aslan, looking not at Diggory, but his counsellors. This is the boy who did it. Oh dear, thought Diggory, what have I done now? Son of Adam, said the lion, there is an evil witch abroad in my new land of Narnia. Tell these good beasts how she came here. A, do a dozen different things that he might say flashed through Diggory's mind, but he had the sense to say nothing except the exact truth. I bought her, Aslan, he answered in a low voice. For what purpose? I wanted to get her out of my own world back into her own. I thought I was taking her back to her own place. How, can she, how came she to be in your world, son of Adam? By magic. The lion said nothing and Diggory knew that he, was, he had told enough. It was my uncle Aslan, he said. He sent us out of our own world by magic rings. At least I had to go because he sent Polly first. And then we met the witch in a place called Charn. And she just held on to us when you met the witch said Aslan in a low voice which had a threat of a growl in it. She woke up, said Diggory wretchedly, and then turning very white, I mean, I woke her because I wanted to know what would happen if I struck a bell. Polly didn't want to. It wasn't her fault. I, I fought her. I know I shouldn't have. I think I was a bit enchanted by the writing under the bell. Do you? asked Aslan still speaking very low and deep. No, said Diggory, I see now I wasn't. I was only pretending. There was a long pause and Diggory was thinking all the time, I've spoilt everything. There's no chance of getting anything from Mother now. When the lion spoke again, it was not to Diggory. You see, friends, he said, that before the new clean world I gave you is seven hours old, a force of evil has already entered it waked and brought hither by this son of Adam. 
The beasts, even Strawberry, all turned their eyes on Diggory till he felt that he wished the ground would swallow him up. But do not be cast down, said Aslan, still speaking to the beasts. Evil will come of that evil, but it is still a long way off, and I will see to it that the worst falls upon myself. In the meantime, let us take such order that for many hundreds of years yet this shall be a merry land in a merry world. And as Adam's face has done the harm, Adam's race shall help to deal with it. Draw near the other two. The last words were spoken to Polly and to the cabbie who had now arrived. Polly, all eyes and mouth, was staring at Aslan and holding the cabbie's hand rather tightly. The cabbie gave one glance at the lion and took off his bowler hat. No one had ever seen him without it. When it was off, he looked younger and nicer and more like a countryman and less like a London cabman. Son, said Aslan to the cabbie, I have known you long. Do you know me? Well, no, sir, said the cabbie. Leastways, not in an ordinary manner of speaking. Yet I feel somehow, if I may, make so free as to how we've met before. It is well, said the lion. You know better than you think you know, and you shall live to know me better yet. How does this land please you? It's a fair treat, sir, said the cabbie. Would you like to live here always? Well, you see, sir, I'm a married man, said the cabbie. If my wife was here, neither of us would ever want to go back to London, I reckon. We're both country folks, really. Aslan threw up his shaggy head, opened his mouth and uttered a long single note. Not very loud, but full of power. Polly's heart jumped in her body when she heard it. She felt sure that it was a call and that anyone who heard that call would want to obey it. And what's more, would be able to obey it. However, many worlds and ages lay between. And so, though she was filled with wonder, she was not really astonished or shocked when all of a sudden, a young woman with a kind, honest face stepped out of nowhere and stood beside her. Polly knew at once that it was the cabbie's wife, fetched out of our world, not by any tiresome magic rings, but quickly, simply and sweetly as a bird flies to its nest. The young woman, who had apparently been in the middle of a washing day, for she wore an apron, her sleeves were rolled up to the elbow, and there were soap studs on her hands. If she had had time to put on her good clothes, her best hat and imitation cherries on it, she would have looked dreadful. As it was, she looked rather nice. Of course, she thought she was dreaming. That was why she didn't rush across to her husband and ask him what on earth had just happened to them both. But when she looked at the lion, she didn't feel quite so sure it was a dream. Yet for some reason, she did not appear to be frightened. Then she dropped a little half curtsy, as some country girls still knew how to do in those days. After that, she went and put her hand in the cabbies and stood there looking round rather shyly. My children, said Aslan, fixing his eyes on both of them. Now you are to be the first king and queen of Narnia. The cabbie opened his mouth in astonishment and his wife turned very red. You shall rule and name all these creatures and do justice among them and protect them from their enemies when enemies arise. And enemies will arise, for there is an evil witch in this world. The cabbie swallowed hard two or three times and cleared his throat. Uh, uh, begging your pardon, sir, he said, and thanking you very much, I'm sure, which my missus does the same. But I ain't no sort of chap for a job like that. I never had such an education, you see. Well, said Aslan, can you use a spade and a plough and raise food out of the earth? Yes, sir, I could do that. A bit of sort of work like that, being brought up to it, like. Can you rule these creatures kindly and fairly, remembering that they are not slaves like the dumb beasts of the world you were born in, but talking beasts and free subjects? I see that, sir replied the cabbie. I tried to do the square thing by them all. And would you bring up your children and grandchildren to do the same? It'd be up to me to try, sir. I'd do my best, wouldn't we, Nelly? And you wouldn't have favourite 
e favourites either among your own children or among the other creatures or, lot, or let any hold another under it or use it hardly. I never could abide such goings on, sir, and that's the truth. I'd give them what for if I caught them at it, said the cabbie. All through this conversation, his voice was growing slower and richer, more like the country voice he must have had as a boy, and less like the sharp, quick voice of a cockney. And if enemies came up against the land, for enemies will arise, and there was war, would you be the first in the charge and the last in the retreat? Well, sir, said the cabbie very slowly, a chap don't exactly know till he's been tried. I dare say I might turn out ever such a soften. Never did no fighting except with me fists. I'd try, that is. I hope I'd try to do me bit. Then, said Aslan, you will have done all that a king should do. Your coronation will be held presently, and you and your children and grandchildren shall be blessed. And some will be kings of Narnia, and others will be kings of Arkenland, which lies yonder over the southern mountains. And you, little daughter, here he turned to Polly, are welcome. Have you forgiven the boy for the violence he did to you in the Hall of Images in the desolate place of the accursed Charn? Yes, Aslan, we've made it up, said Polly. That is well, said Aslan. And now for the boy himself. <laughs> <laughs>